Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's ASA webinar, Disparities in Alzheimer's Disease, which is part of the Empowering Professionals in Aging series presented by Home Instead. We will be getting started shortly. My name is Julia Burroughs. I am a program coordinator with the American Society on Aging, and we are so glad that you are joining us today. The slides for today's presentation are available under the tab on your screen labeled resources and under the tab labeled CE application here, you will find information on how to obtain CE credit for, these, for this event. You have 60 days to complete the continuing, continuing education application and it may take up to 30 days from the date of your application for us to process your CE credit. If you are not logged in directly to this webinar, that is if you're watching as part of a group and did not log in using an individual confirmed URL, you will not be eligible for continuing education credit because we have no way of tracking your online attendance. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat box on your screen and we will get to those as quickly as possible, but we will also be having a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. So now I will turn it over to Lakeland with Home Instead. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with you today. My name is Lakeland Hogan. I'm Home Instead's gerontologist and caregiver advocate. I'm the one that coordinates this Empowering Professionals in Aging uh, web seminar series. Uh, and today I'm delighted to have a few guests speakers uh, with me, and we're going to be talking about disparities in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Alzheimer's disease and other dementias disproportionately affects women, African Americans, and Latinos. In fact, women are twice as likely to develop the disease as men, and 20% of Americans living with the disease are African Americans, and Latinos are one and a half times more likely to be diagnosed than non-Latino whites. So it's important for us as professionals to understand the disparities that exist among these subset subsets of the population uh, in relation to Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. So uh, I'm excited that you have joined us uh, and that you will get to learn today from two uh, excellent guest speakers from Us Against Alzheimer's. Home Instead has been a longstanding partner of Us Against Alzheimer's, uh, and I'm delighted again to have Stephanie Monroe and Jason Resendez with us um, today. And I want to tell you a little bit more about each of them before I pass it over uh, for them to share uh, the wonderful information that they have prepared for today. So Stephanie Monroe is Director of Equity and Access and Executive Director of African Americans Against Alzheimer's, a network of Us Against Alzheimer's and the first national network to create uh, network created to raise awareness of the impact of Alzheimer's health disparities on communities of color and women, the need for greater minority participation in clinical trials, and the importance focusing on brain health and Alzheimer's risk reduction in all communities. Stephanie is an attorney with three decades of federal public policy experience, including serving as Assistant Secretary of Education for Civil Rights. She also was Chief Counsel of the U.S. Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, and Staff Director of the Senate Subcommittee on Children and Families. Jason Resendez is the Director of Us Against Alzheimer's Center for Brain Health Equity and Head of Latinos Against Alzheimer's Coalition. He's the co-author of Latinos and Alzheimer's Disease, New Numbers Behind the Crisis, a seminal report released with the USC Robel Institute on Aging and contributor to the NIA's National Strategy for Recruitment and Participation in Alzheimer's and Related Dementia's clinical, uh, clinical research. Prior to Us Against Alzheimer's, Jason held senior positions at UNIDOS US and uh, LULAC National Education Service Centers, Inc. He is a Google Next Generation Policy Leader, an Aspen Ideas Health Fellow, and serves on the board of Youth Movement Against Alzheimer's and Consumers for Quality Care. So uh, both Jason and Stephanie are um, such outstanding professionals and experts on this topic, and so I'm delighted um, to be passing it along to them. Uh, but really our objectives are to dive deeper into why these 
uh, various subsets of our population are experiencing higher dementia prevalence, uh, discussing the need for proactive brain health equity, and then learning how we all can decrease these disparities. So that's what we hope that you all leave this webinar knowing more about. Uh, and with that, I will pass it over to Jason. Jason, thanks again for being here. Great, thank you uh, so much, uh, Lakeland, and uh, for having us, and for all of you for tuning in uh, for this important topic. Uh, we're excited to uh, hit on the objectives that Lakeland outlined. Uh, this just provides you with the roadmap that we'll take to get uh, to those objectives, um, including uh, just a little bit about the work of us against Alzheimer's to advance what we call brain health equity. Us against Alzheimer's is a patient advocacy and social impact-based organization that really focused on addressing the hardest to uh, address problems uh, in the race to effectively treat and cure and prevent Alzheimer's disease. Uh, that includes a necessary focus on health equity and access, which will be the primary uh, point of discussion for today, uh, but that also uh, is critical to uh, advancing brain health and early intervention to elevating the voice of the patient and caregiver, uh, and also to speeding treatments. And so we see these as the elements that are really necessary uh, to advance uh, equitable uh, treatments, cures, and interventions to address our shared Alzheimer's challenge. And the vehicle that we do that through uh, in the health equity space is our Center for Brain Health Equity, which drives collaboration uh, to address the over impact of Alzheimer's on communities of color, as Lakeland mentioned, and as we'll dive more deeply into with a particular focus on black and Latino communities. And we do this through a three-pronged strategy that's focused on one, uh, mobilizing minority serving health providers, um, two, empowering community partners uh, with data on brain health inequities and making that data accessible and actionable so that we can better understand where disparities are manifesting on the local level uh, and, and to inform our ability to marshal resources and partnerships to turn that data into action to narrow uh, the disparities that we know are impacting uh, communities of color and also women. Uh, third, uh, and really critically, is making sure that all of the work that we're doing, whether that's the development of educational materials, curriculum, messaging, policies, research studies, making sure those are culturally tailored uh, to the communities that are at highest risk for Alzheimer's and related dementia. So we advance the importance of cultural uh, sensitivity uh, and tailoring in the work that we do. And we do this in partnership with uh, a wide set of partners. Uh, I think uh, given the focus today on healthcare professionals, I'll highlight our partnership uh, supported by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Healthy Brain Initiative, uh, which is a collaborative with the National Black Nurses Association, the National Association of Hispanic Nurses, and also Alzheimer's Los Angeles uh, to empower nurses uh, to be leaders uh, in brain health promotion in underserved communities. So making sure that we are equipping uh, nurse leaders uh, in communities and in practices with the information that they need, the culturally tailored information that they need uh, to address and to educate uh, communities uh, about Alzheimer's and brain health from a culturally tailored perspective. Uh, and that is absolutely critical given the deep disparities that we see uh, in the disease uh, impacting uh, particularly African-American communities uh, and also Latino communities. And to uh, focus and provide an overview of the impact on the Latino community and to provide an overview of the about cognitive health and Alzheimer's. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Stephanie, who, as Lakeland uh, mentioned, is uh, an expert in the field and has been a longtime champion for equity uh, and helped to shape really our national conversation around Alzheimer's in the African-American community. Uh, very excited to turn it over to Stephanie McGraw. Thanks, Jason. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, participate in this um, important conversation. Um, about brain health, about cognitive health, about preventing disease. So I'm going to give you a little 101 about cognitive health 
um, and prevention of, of Alzheimer's disease or things that we think we can, we can do. Um, first, I think it's important um, to understand that we have normal um, ways of aging, right? We, we all experience, I think, some forgetfulness, putting our keys down in different places, not remembering why we came into a room. Um, those are generally considered normal until they get to the place where it becomes very routine, where you're um, being very repetitive in having these problems happen, where places where you would normally travel to or um, activities that you would normally be able to engage in, um, you're really not able to function. And so those are times when we need to think about what's going on cognitively. A lot of times people don't even really think about the brain itself. In fact, the brain is the engine of our entire body. Nothing functions if our brain is not functioning well. So when we talk about cognitive health, we're not really talking about intelligence. We're talking about the brain's ability to connect, um, to think, to reason, to remember. Um, oftentimes we'll talk about executive functioning, um, activities of daily living. As those activities and these different processes become more challenging, it might be a good idea to seek medical attention to understand what is the cause of these difficulties. Sometimes these causes can be reversed depending on what the cause is, whether it was a stroke, a medical reaction to aspirin and some other medications that could impede your memory, um, whether there are other kinds of issues. Urinary tract infections also seem to have some of these early things that cause people to have memory challenges. But then there is the issue of, of actual cognitive health. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. So when we started doing this work um, and started looking at statistics, it became very clear very quickly that race and ethnicity um, were uh, drivers or we saw disparities in communities of color, um, in women, um, in people of, of different ethnic um, and ancestry, and began to do a deeper dive into what we knew, what research told us about what those causes were where they were present? Could we look at data to understand um, the trajectory of these diseases? Why it was that certain communities may be um, experiencing um, these um, causes more than others? So we have to understand that um, race and ethnicity can actually influence how we define brain health. Um, in the black community, for example, um, we talk about keeping your mind sharp. Um, you often go to a church and the pastor will begin with thanking God that you're of your right mind. Um, some of these things are, I guess, sort of normative cultural explanations for what's happening, um, but some of them actually can have a negative impact in terms of not recognizing that this is in fact a, a medical issue for which care should be sought um, and uh, for which there might be some opportunities to, to address it. So when we think about Alzheimer's disease, it's good to think about it, I think, as an umbrella. Um, Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia. About 75% of all dementias are of an Alzheimer's type. Um, it's important to understand what type of dementia you have because the plans for those different types of dementia, like frontal temporal and Lewy bodies and vascular, um, there may be different opportunities for interventions that you and your medical provider could suggest, depending on the particular cause. Um, medicines, which are becoming very precise and being able to better target um, these different causes, that's something that you need to understand as well um, as, a, as a potential patient. Um, it's also important to understand that Alzheimer's is a progressive disease. It begins with mild memory loss and then possibly leads to the um, loss of our ability to carry on conversation or again, activities of daily living, such as eating, um, remaining hydrated, um, tending to your medicines correctly, um, walking, swallowing, things of that nature. We often talk about Alzheimer's as just affecting the memory, but it really does affect all activities of daily living um, 
to the point where many people who have Alzheimer's may end up um, needing 24-7 care um, to be able to, uh, to live their lives. Alzheimer's disease does increase with age, but it's not a normal part of aging, and that's very important um, to understand. Like many diseases, actually, cancer and other diseases increase with age, so Alzheimer's is not um, abnormal in that respect. But it is true that one out of every eight individuals over 65 years of age has Alzheimer's, and that nearly half of individuals over the age of, of 85 will have Alzheimer's disease. One thing that's interesting is that among all the diseases, the, the top 10 um, diseases, which would include breast cancer, prostate cancer, heart disease, stroke, HIV, Alzheimer's is the only leading cause of death that's still on the rise. In fact, about 71% uh, um, increase per year of, of people living with or being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Because our nation is, is aging and is browning, um, by 2030, um, it's projected that nearly 40% of Americans living with Alzheimer's will be Latino or African American. And so it's important to understand why this is and what can we do to reach communities with effective awareness raising methods, methodology, um, opportunities for assessments and screening, prevention strategies. We need to understand that this is going to be the new majority population, and, and unfortunately, a lot of them are going to have. Alzheimer's disease. So looking at Alzheimer's disease very specifically in the black population, um, so many, um, unfortunately, comorbidities that we see coming alongside of Alzheimer's disease, blacks have a greater likelihood to have experienced than non-Hispanic white Americans. 44% more likely to have a stroke, 23% more likely to be obese, 25% more, percent more likely to die from heart disease, 72% more likely to be diabetic. And all of these comorbidities we often see in patients who have Alzheimer's disease. We don't know if they are the causes. Um, we don't know if they are an effect. But we do know that they are present and that we have to pay close attention to those factors um, if we're able to better control them. Um, science has uh, been able to demonstrate that we, in fact, can lower our risk of developing Alzheimer's. But we know that blacks are twice as likely as non-Hispanic whites to have Alzheimer's disease. Nationwide, we've got 6.2 million Americans who currently have Alzheimer's disease, and 1.1 million, or about 20 percent, are African American. This is really important because African Americans are only about 13 percent of the population, and so you begin to see this dynamic of overrepresentation in this disease. It's the sixth leading cause of death for all Americans and the fourth leading cause of death for older African Americans. Coming alongside of individuals living with Alzheimer's in order to assist with their daily care and their routines, we have 16 million Americans providing about 18.6 billion hours of unpaid care for people living with Alzheimer's. That value, were to be, you to be paid for that, is nearly $244 billion. And so one of the things that we want to look at is, you know, how do we include caregivers in the care that we're providing individuals living with Alzheimer's disease? Because it's a very strenuous, often stressful um, activity of watching a loved one um, go through this trajectory of Alzheimer's disease. In fact, um, and unfortunately, um, I've been working for Alzheimer's, us against Alzheimer's for about 10 years, and three years into that work, my father received the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So I can speak from personal experience that the caregiving um, aspect of this is very, very significant. Um, often we see uh, caregivers who um, aren't receiving training, not really sure of what they should be doing, not really given opportunities to plan for their future. Um, or their new tomorrow and what it's going to look like with this loved one. Um, sometimes we see caregivers getting sicker and dying even before the person that they're taking care of. So if you see a person with Alzheimer's, you really are seeing two patients. As I said a few minutes ago, African Americans um, comprise about 13.6% of the population, but we're also bearing over 33% of the cost of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. 
And most of these costs are unreimbursed caregiving costs. We also have loss of productivity um, that's very significant. Um, the economic burden um, for Alzheimer's was about $71.6 billion, and these numbers are going to be um, growing um, every year as the cost of health care and care itself um, are growing. Um, about 60% of these costs represent caregiving costs. We see health costs coming in in, in terms of managing the comorbidities that accompany Alzheimer's disease, um, but also in the latter stages where individuals find themselves sometimes in and out of hospitals, in and out of nursing care, and sometimes in and out of hospice. More than 60% of these costs are borne by women, and women actually get a double whammy because about 60% of people with Alzheimer's disease also happen to be women. In terms of working adults who um, are trying to care for a loved one with Alzheimer's or they themselves might be living with Alzheimer's disease, um, African Americans between 40 and 64 lost about 6.1 billion in labor market productivity due to Alzheimer's, mostly from lost wages. And this speaks to the need for our country to develop public policy that allows individuals to remain in the marketplace as long as they can, both for their own health and well-being, but also to be able to maintain um, the finances of, of their family, um, and especially for marginalized communities um, who have dealt with issues through civil rights and, and other forms of discrimination. Um, you might be looking at first generation um, going into um, college, that wealth can be wiped out with one person with Alzheimer's disease when the caregiving costs, um, if you look at placing your, your loved one in out-of-home caregiving, could be um, between five and $10,000 per month. Again, this is a chart that shows us what the caregiving um, costs look like. That's the purple. Productivity loss is the green. Nursing home costs, which are significant, and assisted living, and then the bottom, is the projected um, medical care cost. Jason? Great, thanks so much, Stephanie. Uh, and to continue to uh, it, the conversation around inequities, we turn to a focus on the Latino community. And similarly to the disparities uh, that we see in the African American community, we see deeply entrenched uh, health disparities related to comorbid risk factors for Alzheimer's, including stroke, uh, living with obesity, uh, poorly controlled blood pressure, and diabetes. And so we see higher rates of these comorbid risk factors in the Latino community as compared to the non-Hispanic white community, uh, which in part contribute to Latinos being about one and a half times uh, more likely to develop Alzheimer's than non-Hispanic whites. At the same time, uh, I say this is only a part of the puzzle, uh, and we'll explore uh, a little bit further in the presentation the role that social determinants of health play uh, in shaping uh, risk for cognitive decline in later life. So it's important to remember that these disparities, while are certainly a factor, they don't explain uh, these inequities completely. Uh, so uh, it's important for us to continue to invest in understanding why is it that Latino and, and African American communities and other communities of color are at higher risk of Alzheimer's. Uh, and it's important to look, I think, beyond just the factors within the healthcare system and in biology to also look at social determinant factors, which we'll explore uh, further uh, in just a few minutes. When we look at the projected growth of the impact of Alzheimer's in communities of color, uh, we see that by 2050, uh, we'll see a pretty large increase of Alzheimer's in the Latino community from about 400,000 folks in, in 2020 uh, to over 2.6 million in 2050. And these are based off of projections developed with the U.S. Roy Ball Institute on Aging, uh, which is, we think are pretty conservative. Um, uh, estimate of a of the growth in prevalence. I think one of the big issues is that there isn't enough uh, of an emphasis placed on an accurate surveillance of Alzheimer's and related dementia in communities of color, um, primarily related to 
the underdiagnosis of Alzheimer's in communities of color, uh, which uh, we'll talk about, uh, similar to what we see in the African American community, despite being one and a half times more likely to develop Alzheimer's, Latinos are uh, much less likely to be diagnosed by a provider. In fact, a large uh, study uh, was recently re released of um, the Medicare program in California, uh, California being very uh, diverse and looking at an oversample of Latino, African Americans, and also um, Asian American and Pacific Islanders uh, in California, found uh, a further document the disparities in diagnosis and found one, not only were Latino, Black, and Asian American uh, uh, populations less likely to receive a timely diagnosis, they were also less likely to receive a, a comprehensive evaluation uh, for cognitive health issues compared to non-Hispanic whites. Um, and so it's these, I think, issues that really contribute to uh, in sort of an undercount of prevalence uh, in these communities and something that we all have to work towards addressing. At the same time, we know that um, uh, through available data that this is a, a community that is highly impacted uh, by um, Alzheimer's and related dementias. And so with that impact comes a high cost, a high cost on individuals, their families, and in turn, uh, the uh, economic uh, system. Um, and so here we see a projected cost, um, indirect and direct cost of Alzheimer's uh, in the Latino community. Um, I think if I, yeah, here we go. Uh, uh, we see a projected cost by 2060 of 105 billion uh, annually, but the cumulative cost, if things were not to change between now and 2060, the cumulative cost of Alzheimer's in the Latino community would reach an estimated $2.3 trillion. That's $2.3 trillion of um, economic power and wealth wiped out by one disease, uh, which is uh, you know, really underscores the need for swift action on Alzheimer's, but particularly action and efforts to narrow the disparities that we're talking about today. So when we think about how Alzheimer's impacts communities differently in the Latino community differently, uh, one, we talked about disparities in diagnosis. Uh, economic uh, disparities. Uh, when we look at research done around symptomatic differences, um, this is a, a study done at the Texas Tech University uh, looking at symptomatic differences among Latino Americans and non-Hispanic whites and found uh, that when you compare these two groups, you see uh, divergences in how uh, symptoms uh, are presented uh, in these groups with higher rates of depression among Latino Americans, higher rates of agitation, higher rates of hallucinations and delusions. Uh, so it's important to keep these differences in mind as we think about uh, interventions, messaging, and certainly caregiver support, right? Because caregivers are on the front lines of helping to manage these symptoms on behalf of their loved ones. So specialized training related to uh, these symptoms that are experienced at higher rates in uh, communities of color, I think are warranted. And we know that care support training uh, is very limited, particularly from a culturally uh, sensitive standpoint um, is underutilized uh, by communities of color compared to non-Hispanic whites. Uh, and so certainly an important factor to keep in mind uh, as we're working to improve uh, care training for families navigating dementia uh, and Alzheimer's. As we think about what are the things that might be contributing to these disparities, sort of going back to um, factors that we have to take into consideration beyond biology. Uh, this is a, a graph of uh, presenting research done by the Alzheimer's Association, looking at racial discrimination experienced uh, by uh, communities of color as they navigate uh, the healthcare system. And I think this is really revealing data showing that Black Americans, Latino Americans, Native Americans, and Asian Americans uh, experience episodic discrimination uh, much more frequently than non-Hispanic whites. Uh, in fact, experience uh, regular discrimination at much higher rates than non-Hispanic whites, particularly among Black and Native Americans. Um, and so as we think about putting into context the underdiagnosis of uh, Alzheimer's and related dementias among communities of color, we can't disentangle that from the experience of systemic racism that these communities often face while navigating the healthcare system. 
another factor I think that's related is uh, data showing that communities of color prefer uh, to engage providers uh, who understand uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds. Um, so this is really backs up research showing that uh, particular communities of color, particularly African American and Latino community members, uh, really feel like they get better care from a provider uh, who has uh, understanding of their cultural background, and particularly if that provider is of the same race ethnicity, so race concordant um, care. Um, and we see that uh, this is an important factor among communities of color, particularly among Native American, Black Americans, and Hispanic American. I mean, I think it's high across the board compared to non-Hispanic whites. At the same time, you see very low levels of competence among these communities that they'll be able to access that culturally competent care. So one, we have data showing that this is important uh, to individuals at higher risk of Alzheimer's, but the competence that they'll actually be able to utilize that care uh, is, is extremely low among these communities. So altogether, I think that provides a, a very high level overview of the disparities that exist in the Latino community, along with some of the potential systemic um, drivers of those inequities in the healthcare system and in society more generally. Uh, next, I want to talk about more about these underlying drivers uh, of these disparities uh, and really the emerging science around the role that social determinants of health play in shaping cognitive decline in later life. Uh, and more and more research is coming out that points to the importance of place when it comes to brain health. I think everyone uh, over the last really 20 years has come to an understanding that place matters when it comes to health, right? Uh, your zip code really matters in determining your health outcomes and your ability to effectively manage um, diseases that individuals in communities of color might be at higher risk for. Um, and more recently, that is starting to also prove true for cognitive health. Uh, as well. So we've seen amazing research coming from places like Columbia University under the leadership of Dr. Jennifer Manley, uh, from University of Wisconsin School of Public Health under the leadership of Dr. Amy Kind, that points to the role that community level factors, whether that's educational quality or poverty play in shaping uh, cognitive decline in later life. And while we're not saying that these factors are directly causing Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline, uh, they certainly are shaping uh, our ability to address these, these issues uh, and are shaping the health outcomes once an individual is diagnosed uh, with disease. So we were interested at Us Against Alzheimer's to better understand well, what does this look like on the ground in communities that are highly impacted by Alzheimer's. So we partnered with the National Minority Quality Forum and the Urban Institute to leverage a tool called the National Alzheimer's Disease Index, which uh, we developed uh, that uh, enables us to visualize Medicare data at the zip code, uh, county, uh, state, and even congressional uh, district level to pair that data with data on the social determinants of health, to understand in communities that are highly impacted by Alzheimer's, um, what do we see in terms of trends uh, on the social determinants of health? Uh, so that we can better understand the context on the ground to inform intervention development. So we identified the top 25 counties most impacted by Alzheimer's among Black and Latino Americans and the bottom 25 counties, uh, so the least uh, impacted by Alzheimer's among Black and Latino Americans, uh, and then looked at a number of factors that we know are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So educational quality, um, access to exercise, uh, 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 social isolation, a number of factors uh, that we know are related to, to Alzheimer's uh, to understand and identify trends. And what we found was that across the communities that are most impacted by Alzheimer's among Blacks and Latinos, we saw deep social inequities uh, in, uh, back in issues like poverty. So in communities that are the most impacted by Alzheimer's, we saw higher rates of poverty. We saw lower median household incomes. We saw lower rates of health insurance. We saw fewer opportunities for exercise as represented by the built environments. When we looked at education, we saw across the board, even in the white counties most impacted by Alzheimer's, that educational quality uh, was lower in the counties most impacted compared to the counties least impacted. So what this data shows us again is not that these are causing Alzheimer's, but it's showing that these counties that are highly impacted are low resourced uh, and have uh, inequities in 
uh, these social determinant factors that we know are playing a role uh, in driving um, risk for Alzheimer's in, in later life. And so you might be familiar with the Lancet Commission who did an assessment uh, of factors uh, related to dementia and found that 40% of dementia cases could be prevented by addressing certain lifestyle factors. So by increasing education, by increasing physical activity, by decreasing uh, obesity, excessive alcohol intake, could potentially modify risk for dementia in later life. At the same time, our data shows that these factors represent deep social inequities in these communities. So um, it's not very easy to prescribe to a family living, living below the poverty line, uh, get a better quality education or to get higher levels of physical activity when maybe that family is living in a community with a lack of safe, uh, playgrounds or a community that is crisscrossed by highways. So as we think about the promise of brain health and risk modification, we also have to recognize that many of the factors uh, that can help us realize that promise um, are disproportionately impact communities of color. And so we have to factor that into our development of intervention, educational messaging, and efforts to address these um, inequities uh, impacting communities of color. Uh, so moving on, as we think about how we start to advance brain health equity, I think that sets the, the stage, you know, the importance of considering social determinant factors, looking at the entire puzzle beyond biological risk, uh, and really thinking about this from a systems-based approach. And so to bridge the barriers of Alzheimer's disease education um, and uh, treatment and prevention in Black and Latino communities, we have to focus on a couple things. One, I think what we're doing now, prepare the workforce, uh, raise uh, levels of awareness uh, and baseline levels of knowledge about how um, Alzheimer's and related dementia uh, impact communities of color uh, and be cognizant of the differences. Uh, two, we have to recognize and address bias in how we uh, treat Alzheimer's in these communities, whether that is in the case of the development of screening and assessment tools or in how uh, we engage with um, uh, patients and uh, clients in practices. I mean, the data from the Alzheimer's Association, I think beautifully underscores the fact that whether we think it's happening or not, individuals uh, are reporting uh, discrimination as they navigate the healthcare system and seeking these services. And so we have to question and address those biases in the work that we're doing. Um, we have to uh, really tackle the underreporting um, of uh, dementia in communities of color and really work on developing a better understanding of how this is impacting these communities and a more holistic understanding of how uh, Alzheimer's is impacting communities of color. So that means improved surveillance uh, at the public health level. Um, the CDC is leading great work there in the adoption of the behavioral uh, BRFIS data and the uh, cognitive uh, module of BRFIS uh, at the state level and disaggregating that by race, ethnicity, and also gender. Um, and so embracing and, and resourcing those efforts is absolutely critical. Um, and then tackling this uh, underdiagnosis uh, and improving our ability to intervene earlier um, so that families have more opportunities to take action on, on their brain health um, across the lifespan. And that's why at Us Against Alzheimer's, we've developed a platform called Brain Guide. Uh, which works to empower uh, people and families to have the education, the knowledge they need to take the next steps in managing their own brain health. And Brain Guide is something that we developed in partnership with a diverse set um, of providers and community representatives uh, to help families navigate their brain health journey. It includes an online memory questionnaire that can be uh, administered via again, online, on the website, or through a phone uh, box application, um, or through you know, text on your phone. Um, this is something that's available in English and Spanish. Uh, it is uh, developed uh, to provide tailored resources based off of the results of that questionnaire uh, through a partnership with US Aging, formerly N4A, 
uh, to ensure that folks have access not just to evergreen resources, which are included, but to resources that are relevant to them in their local communities. Um, and again, we paid special attention to ensure that uh, we looked at communities uh, who are highly impacted by Alzheimer's yet often underserved uh, through everything that we did in the development of the platform, including the experts that we uh, worked with to develop this, including the user testing, uh, including the um, assessments uh, that serve as the underlying foundation for the memory questionnaires, um, ensuring that we looked at how they addressed uh, potential racial bias and educational bias in the selection of those uh, questionnaires. Um, and so it's, it's just one example of how we need to design for inclusion uh, to address the inequities uh, that we've I think provided an overview uh, in Stephanie's presentation. And in my presentation, we'd be happy to work with anyone um, uh, today uh, to help address these. Uh, we are uh, know that we need to do all this work in partnership with others, given the scale of this challenge um, and the uh, you know multifaceted uh, nature of the Alzheimer's um, crisis. Uh, we need as many partners as possible. So. Uh, excited uh, to take questions, uh, and we'll turn it over to you, Lakeland. Thank you so much, Jason, and thank you, Stephanie, for providing all of that that wonderful information. I was writing down lots of notes. I I know I've I've heard you both speak on this topic before, but I learned something new every time um, that that I have the opportunity to connect with you both. So thank you so much for, for sharing today and for sharing about Brain Guide. Uh, I think that that is such a fantastic tool that the uh, that your organization has created and, and mybrainguide.org, I believe was the, the website. Um, I would encourage everyone on this call to go check it out. It really is a, a great tool um, that professionals can pass along to those that they're, that they're working with or even use, that, use this tool within their own families. Um, so thank you both again for, for sharing. And as Jason mentioned, we're going to open it up for Q&A. So uh, we would love for all of you to submit your questions. Um, there is a Q&A box where you can type in your question at any time, and, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can here. Uh, and while we're doing q and I'll just put up this last slide with, with all of the contact information. If you want to reach out to Jason or Stephanie, um, their emails are up there, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, one question that I have come in that I think is very timely is, has the COVID pandemic caused issues with Alzheimer's, such as individuals not going to the doctor and not receiving a diagnosis of this disease? I'm not sure who wants to tackle that question, but um, Jason or Stephanie, have you seen this, uh, the, the pandemic causing issues with, with diagnosis and detection? Um, this is Stephanie. I'll take a stab. Um, I mean, we certainly expect that that is the case. Um, I think as things, um, you know, among uh, places throughout the country are really just beginning to fully reopen, um, we expect to see more and more um, if there's a way for people to um, be asked, you know, when do they first um, see symptoms and you know, maybe they'll be asked what actually caused them, you know, delay in coming in. Um, but it's going to be really challenging, I think. Um, we already see these communities, unfortunately, um, getting late access to medical care and assessments that they need. Um, we're trying to get people to go earlier because one of the, I guess, hopeful things about Alzheimer's is that um, you can start actually developing symptoms about um, well, start developing brain changes before, you know, big symptoms start to appear. So the earlier we can get to individuals before they start showing significant symptoms, the more likely that the medicines that are currently available will be able um, to help them. Um, unfortunately, with both Blacks and Latinas, they often go in and they're, you know, my dad was like seven years going in. So he's reaching, by the time he got to the doctor, he was essentially about 14 years into his disease, but he was only treated at year seven. Um, so that's something that we really need to, to focus on in raising awareness um, with tools like Brain Guide and um, provider education and consumer awareness for things that they should be reaching out to ask their doctor to check for them. Yeah, and I would add on top of that, um, you know, good everything that Stephanie said, and research uh, has shown that 
among people with dementia, black uh, patients are, were nearly three times more likely to be infected with COVID-19. So we know that mm -hmm. dementia patients, particularly dementia patients of color, are more susceptible to COVID. Um, and so certainly there's been a tremendous impact uh, on the community due to COVID, one, from a health risk perspective, uh, two, from a utilization uh, of health services, um, as Stephanie pointed out and as the questionnaire alluded to, um, but then also in terms of you know, the impact on families navigating both dementia care uh, and work. I mean, we've seen during the pandemic, for example, caregivers of individuals living with dementia who've been disproportionately impacted by COVID from a workforce disruption perspective, particularly women of color leaving the workforce that, uh, and we know that already, even before the pandemic, 19% of women providing dementia care were forced to, to leave work to provide that care. We've seen that get much worse during the pandemic. So uh, really underscores our uh, need to think about both how we address the issues from a healthcare perspective and what the healthcare system can do, but that certainly intersects with factors outside the health system. Uh, and how we expect more of our employers uh, and um, our public health system to help bridge uh, these disparities as well. Thank you both for sharing your insights. And we have some kind of some comments that have come in in kind of relation to this conversation that I thought I would um, share out. Um, uh, we ha we have someone that is sharing that you know through social distancing and not having contact with families, they've noticed an increase in dementia. And, and Jason and Stephanie, I know uh, the Us Against Alzheimer's A-List did a great survey through, or did a great series of surveys throughout the pandemic to really get a pulse on what uh, family care partners and people living with dementia were experiencing during the pandemic. And if my memory serves me correct, one thing that they found commonly was that um, they, uh, many family members, care partners saw a decline in their loved one because of, uh, you know, social distancing, reduced inter social interactions. Um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that that question uh, kind of as, as uh, it relates to our conversation around the pandemic and, and, and dementia and diagnosis. I also um, saw a great question that came in that I would uh, – be interested to hear your, your thoughts and comments on is, uh, do you see negative stigma or labeling as an issue for African American and Latino families deciding not, deciding, or pardon me, declining or not seeking medical attention when the signs and symptoms first arrive, arise for, for dementia or Alzheimer's? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and unfortunately, that's the case. Um, I think especially in the black community, we see, um, I guess, a myth that, again, that forgetfulness, um, early signs of Alzheimer's are a normal part of aging. And so oftentimes in those families, you'll see you know, people just accepting the changes as part of aging. They don't think it's a medical issue. Um, in fact, our, for one of the first doctors that we took my dad to um, didn't help matters by asking me when we, when we were raising concerns, you know, I asked him if he could provide a diagnosis. He wanted to know why I would want to know. So there's a lot of, I think, um, bias um, about things that affect mental health in general. Um, Alzheimer's disease, um, though not traditionally considered a mental health issue, um, is in that category where people are a bit ashamed. They're fearful. They don't know how they're, um, if they're still working, how their employers um, might treat them. They don't know how they're family and sometimes friends um, will treat them. They don't know um, whether they're going to lose their license, their ability to drive right away, um, because sometimes people aren't as sensitive and understanding that once you've seen one case of Alzheimer's, you've seen, seen one case of Alzheimer's. So we really need to normalize and give people permission to ask these important questions. And even better, we want to make sure that, you know, as people are seeing their doctors, just as when you would see a pediatrician, they would be doing certain things and give you, you know, a rating in terms of where your child was progressing. We want to see that type of routinization of, of brain health 
treatment so that it becomes a normal part of your um, physician annual visit or your Medicare um, visit. Yeah, and I would just I'd jump on that. And I think we see a similar issue in the Latino community. Um, and one, I want to note that the Latino community, as with the African American community, is not a um, one monolithic community, um, but you know, made up of rich cultural heritages, and is you know different in a place like Southern Florida than a place like even Central Florida to some extent, and certainly to compared to California. Um, but we do see stigma play a role from a cultural perspective. I think one is um, really just around misunderstanding, sort of not knowing, as Stephanie pointed out, um, that extreme memory loss is not a normal part of aging and that Alzheimer's is a progressive brain disease. I think there's a lot more recognition around issues like diabetes and heart disease because there's more of a cultural conversation, more of a healthcare conversation. Um, for a longer period of time around those health issues. Um, we still see disparities um, in those um, issues uh, as well, but um, certainly more efforts uh, to destigmatize, to demystify those issues in those communities have been placed and, and compared to Alzheimer's. Um, so I think part of the stigma is really related to low levels of education and understanding. Uh, and certainly a role, there's an important role for healthcare providers uh, in that. Um, in understanding there are things that, um, as Stephanie pointed out, things that you can do to address your risk for cognitive decline in later life, to promote good brain health, to, um, you know, access resources and training. Um, and I think it's really important because of that stigma to do this in a culturally sensitive and responsive way. Uh, we've tried to, we certainly champion leaning into culture to help address stigma in two ways. One, um, uh, Stephanie could talk more about than me, but a play that um, Stephanie launched called Forget Me Not, targeting uh, the African-American community. We launched an uh, initiative around the uh, cultural tradition of Day of the Dead, which actually just ended yesterday, um, but uh, uh, was really brought to life by the Disney film Coco, which had a lot of themes related to memory loss and to um, caregiving. And we leaned into that to target, particularly Mexican-Americans, where Day of the Dead is a more prominent tradition than compared to, let's say, uh, um, Cuban-Americans, for example. So really leaning into culture to help spark conversations and to show, oh, here we have a, a portrayal of memory loss and caregiving on the big screen to help folks feel comfortable with talking about a highly stigmatized issue. So um, I'll just end by saying it's a matter of educational awareness. It's a matter of how we leverage culture to bring this issue out of the shadows in these communities. Thank you for sharing that. I I uh, recently saw the movie Coco, and I thought that it was um, such a, a great movie. And I, I love that you're using uh, kind of our mass media to get these conversations started or what we're seeing on the big screen is is starting to tackle the topic of Alzheimer's disease and memory loss. And, and I think it is starting to spark conversations across communities. So I think those are some really great examples um, of, of how we can get the conversation started uh, in our own communities. So thank you so much for sharing that information. Um, Another question that's come in um, that kind of ties into this risk reduction that you both had talked about is uh, this individual um, is wondering if the disease runs in her family. Her father just died from this disease in August, and she's asking, you know, what should she be doing for her own brain health and to prepare for what may come? Uh, and I want to kind of dovetail on her question and ask, um, you know, when you're working within uh, the African-American culture and the Latino cultures or, or uh, communities, are you seeing um, these kinds of questions popping up, people wondering, you know, my mom has had this disease, is it going to affect me, and uh, what kind of education is being done in, in kind of this realm? Well, I know that there are um, certain genetic studies um, I'm not sure if this individual is African American or not, but Goldie Bird um, down at Wake Forest has been running the largest genetic study of African Americans and Alzheimer's disease, especially where there are 
are large members of the family who've already been diagnosed to have a better understanding of, you know, what if any of their, you know, genetic um, connections there might be. Um, so it's research that's still underway, but we also know that many people in the same family, even if there's not a genetic um, uh, predisposition, they are usually in basically the same location um, as, as other family members. Um, so some of those social determinant issues in terms of place may be impacting them. Um, they usually are eating the same types of foods or favorite recipes. Um, they may have the same types of exercise habits, um, sleep habits, and other things that we know can impact the likelihood that you would um, develop Alzheimer's. And so um, there might be a connection. It might be genetic. It might be lifestyle. Um, but certainly to pay attention in mitigating stress and having good nutrition, exercise, being socialized, um, and making sure that you get your routine medical examinations um, would be key. Yeah, and I would just add on to that. You know, I think this is exactly why we built mybrainguide.org to help uh, families navigate and understand these questions and opportunities for taking, you know, really brain health into your hands. Um, so I think that's a great resource. And then I would just say it's like a, a, a scrib note is what's good for the heart is good for the brain, right? Lean into what you know about heart health um, to help promote brain health. And so all the things that Stephanie said, I think, um, make great sense. I don't think, you know, we're not at a place where we can say if you do all these things, you will never get Alzheimer's, right? That's not the case, even with things that we know are tested for heart disease. Um, but it is about how we can potentially modify risk. Um, and so learning about that risk, I think, is the first uh, step. And I think mybrainguide.org is, is a great resource for that. Thank you, Jason, for sharing uh, that and, and Stephanie for, for your comments on that question. Um, this question comes from a provider. Um, she's asking, as we treat more diverse populations, how do we know we are being culturally sensitive? What can we do as providers to help decrease the cultural issues? I think that's a great question, and I think you were uh, that asking that question is the first step, right, to um, making sure that you are being responsive to all the patients um, and clients that you're seeing. Uh, so I think lean into training that's available to you related to understanding, you know, racial bias, the implicit um, uh, racial bias training, for example. I think there's amazing resources. The American Academy of Neurology recently just launched um, what they call an anti-racism uh, training for its members. So identifying if you have a professional society that you're a part of, what training do they offer related to racial bias? Um, I think that is, you know, a, a good step. Um, and then also, you know, talking with your patients, um, I think, is in, in sensing, you know, are they getting everything that they need? Um, and if you are worried about asking something, I think um, uh, in having an open conversation in the spirit of wanting to learn and wanting to serve and better serve that patient um, can help you navigate those, those issues. Yeah, I was going to completely agree 100% with the, the last point of not being afraid to to ask. I mean, patients are used to coming in, number one, and filling out tons of paperwork and questions about all kinds of things that don't seem necessarily directly related to their health. Um, but you can certainly add a question to that um, in addition to um, having um, a face-to-face -face conversation. But I think, you know, doing that shows that your, your heart is definitely in the right place and people will receive it um, appropriately. Thank you both for for addressing that last question. I think it's a good one to end on. We only just have a few more minutes uh, till the top of the hour. Uh, and I know that uh, all, of the, all of these questions were um, so helpful in, in rounding out this conversation. I apologize we weren't able to get to all of them. We got to as many of them as we could. But uh, I just want to thank uh, Stephanie and Jason one more time for, for being here today, uh, for sharing this great information, and for all of you uh, for joining, because as um, as Stephanie and Jason just mentioned, you know, engaging in conversations like this is um, a great first step or next step in our um, in in ways that we can inform ourselves and be more um, culturally um, 
responsive to the needs of those that we serve. So I want to thank you both so much for being here. Yes, fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Again, if you would like to claim CEUs for today's webinar, you will be receiving a follow-up email by the end of the business day that will contain a link to the CEU application. In that email, the slides will also be attached. I think a few people might have had some issues accessing those. That um, follow-up email will also contain a link. Um, again, for that CEU application, you have 60 days to complete that application, and it may take up to 30 days for us to process it in, on our end. So thank you again to Home Instead and Lakeland and Jason and Stephanie for your time today. We really appreciate, appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Thank you.